um, from uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure. Uh, and the third of our uh, main speaker today will be Miguel Angel Muñoz from uh, Universidad de Granada. So let's start with our, our first speaker, uh, Professor uh, Menran Carda uh, from uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He's interested in many problems uh, related with non-equilibrium collective behavior. Describe it starting from phenomenological equation constructed on the basis of symmetries and conservation laws. He has successfully applied this methodology to several problems involving polymers, flux, flux lines, and growing surface and bacterial range expansion. Thus, his main recent lines are focuses, among other, on disorder systems such as spin and flux glasses, soft matter, including polymers, membranes and gels, anomalous transport and relaxation, fluctuation-induced phenomena, uh, like Casimir forces, electromagnetic fluctuation in and out of equilibrium, and in general, biological physics, studying, for example, cortical patterns, knots in proteins, and in immune response. Today's, uh, today's talk um, is, uh, the title of the, his today talk is, Competing species growing on a rugged front. So, Professor Carda, you can start with your presentation now. You have to put your microphone. Okay. Yes, I thought. Uh, thank you, uh, Joachim, uh, for a very nice introduction. And uh, I'm grateful for uh, uh, the invitation to uh, talk at this uh, uh, very prestigious uh, meeting. Uh, so I will be talking about uh, some work that was done in collaboration with uh, student uh, Sherry Chu, postdoc uh, Jordan Horowitz, uh, Daniel Bender, and David Nelson. And uh, I'll start by uh, telling you what this topic of range expansion is. And a good way to think about it is uh, an experiment that, that was performed in 2007 uh, by a group of uh, Haller, Czech, Herson, Ramanathan, and Nelson. And what they did was uh, they put a drop of E. coli in the center of this dish, and then this E. coli started to grow on the, the uh, agar dish. Now, the E. coli were uh, uh, made to fluorescently uh, uh, shine in two colors, red and green, but otherwise they were kind of identical. And so initially when they put the drop, there was this big mixture of red and green that is indistinguishable because they are mixed and it kind of looks orange. And as time uh, progressed and the bacteria grow out, uh, then there are these sectors that are clearly uh, green or red. And uh, it is easy to understand why this segregation takes place. Because if we look at the front, let's say a cell that is out here at the front uh, and is green, it descended from another cell that was green, another cell that was green going all the way back. Maybe at earlier time, there was a competition between red and green, and it could have been either one of them and then the green one, and all of the descendants of that were green. And so you get a sector that is green, another sector that is red and uh, this pattern has evolved in this fashion. Uh, they could also uh, uh, start the process in a geometry other than uh, putting a drop by having a blade uh, that was inoculated with the E. e coli. And so the pattern of growth started from a straight edge that was expanding either to the top or the bottom. And again, one sees that these sectors of uh, red and green are formed in the process. Now, a simple way to model this process is something that is called a stepping stone model. So what we could do is uh, make a model in which the initial cells here shown in many colors rather than just two colors are put along a line in the X direction. And then at each subsequent time, uh, one of the 
uh, cells uh, reproduces, it can uh, by chance uh, lead to two offspring uh, or zero offspring. And just because of that randomness in reproduction, as time goes on, uh, then uh, uh, the same pattern of sectoring takes place. That is, uh, some of the colors by chance disappear and some of the colors uh, by chance uh, uh, are uh, selected and the front advances in this fashion while the number of colors and their diversity becomes less and less. And this is a larger uh, version of the same pattern that is shown. Uh, the black lines that are indicated here are tracing back the lineages. So for example, you take a cell at the boundary, ask uh, which one of its, uh, uh, who was its parent, and then you go further down and try to trace the parentage of a cell that was at the top. And clearly these paths have to coalesce where you have a common ancestor. And uh, essentially it is easy to see that these paths because we are randomly selecting which one of the two uh, possible parents is going to be selected, uh, have a diffusive character. So that if we go a distance T along this time-like direction in future and future generations, the fluctuations of these paths in the transverse direction should be diffusive characterized by an exponent of one half. Now, the interesting thing in the experiment is that when they characterize these fluctuations, how much uh, as a function, as you go further in time, the transverse fluctuations take place, they found that these transverse fluctuations were stronger than diffusion that would correspond to X squared goes like T and were characterized roughly by an exponent of X squared going like T to the four third or fluctuations being T to the two thirds, which is super diffusive. So a simple way to see how that can happen is to make a more realistic model of how cells grow in which you don't grow one layer at a time, but allow any one of the cells on the frontier uh, to uh, have an offspring. And because you are not selecting the cells in uh, uh, synchronously, which is not something that is uh, physiological or realistic, the front of this uh, pattern that is growing is no longer a straight line and becomes a rough pattern as the one that has been indicated over here. Now, uh, if I hadn't put the colors, this would be a uh, simulation of a growth of an interface that is known as the Eden model. And it is known that somehow characteristics of uh, uh, this Eden model is the relationship between fluctuations along the transverse direction and the time life directions that are super diffusive with an exponent of two thirds. Uh, there is uh, uh, actually an analogy between this growth model and what is called the directed polymers in random media, where the idea is that you have uh, paths that you would prescribe that are moving in the medium where at each location along this path, let's say that each node, you have a random number. And the path wants to uh, sum the uh, random numbers that it encounters and maximize it. And uh, a, an algorithm that gives you the optimal path is indicated over here, where uh, if H is the sum of all of the random numbers up to some point uh, XT, uh, then it can be recursively uh, constructed from one layer to another layer by looking at the two points that it can could have come from and optimizing the sum of the two points. Uh, this uh, pattern of directed polymers in random media is known to have these uh, characteristic fluctuations that are super diffusive and can also be regarded actually as a model of bacterial growth where the random numbers correspond to the size of the uh, bacteria. So rather than thinking about all of the bacteria as being the same size, you can imagine that some of them are slightly bigger, some of them are slightly uh, smaller, uh, 
and the process tries to sort of uh, look at uh, which one of uh, the potential parents uh, can give rise to a, uh, 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 if you like, taller or higher offspring. And uh, that uh, directed path uh, model translated into a uh, growth of cells of different size gives patterns that are shown over here, distinguishing the cases where uh, there is essentially a, a growth where everybody is of the same size and a growth where they are different sizes and we see this uh, difference between the two patterns emerge. Okay, so uh, what are the implications of uh, these paths being super diffusive? And again, uh, let me uh, say that uh, we are really seeing two classes of paths whose uh, intersection and coalescence we can interpret in different ways. One is if we look at uh, the starting point that had a lot of colors, we can see that as time goes on, the number of colors becomes less and less. So the diversity of the different uh, things that were at the bottom as a function of time in this expansion gets less and less and uh, uh, sectors uh, coalesce. And so what we can say is that if we start with an initial uh, sector, let's say uh, that was uh, of color green and span some distance uh, X as a function of time, how long does it survive before that sector disappears uh, by its two edges colliding with each other? Another thing that we can ask is we can look at these uh, genetic lineages. We can take two individuals that are at the front that are a distance X apart and then ask how far back in time do we have to go in order to find their common ancestor? So these two questions uh, can be answered by uh, figuring out how likely it is that two paths that are randomly moving around coalesce for this first time uh, after a time t if they were initially separated by a distance delta x. For the case of diffusive paths, this is a very well-known problem of statistical physics. If you have two random walkers that are a distance delta x apart, how likely it is that they will collide with each other for a first time after a time t and coalesce. And uh, there is a solution based on the method of images that tells you that the rate of this, uh, since it's a rate, it's units of inverse time has a factor of one over time. It depends on how far they are proportionately to the length. And uh, since lengths are uh, diffusive in nature, this delta x has to be made dimensionless by square root of theta. And because things are taking place diffusively, the probability that two paths are very far apart, uh, delta x after a time t is governed by the uh, diffusive curve. So essentially this uh, probability of collision at time t has two limits. One is when uh, you are looking at very uh, short distances, delta x that is much less than the characteristic diffusive time, you can forget the exponential and then it is simply uh, delta x divided by tau to some power. Or we can look at uh, things that are very, very far apart, much larger than the uh, diffusion distance, and then you have to sort of uh, rely on the tail of the diffusive kernel in order to see a collision to take place. And you have uh, this uh, exponential that governs things. Now, we don't know the analogous thing for these things where the paths are not diffusive, but they are super diffusive. So we did numerical simulations. And based on the numerical simulations, actually we find a form uh, that is very similar not surprisingly, as I told you, the characteristic uh, distances and times are related by this exponent of two thirds rather than one half, that the results that we get as a function of time and separation are, can be rescaled appropriately by choosing this combination. And then again, 
like the case of the diffusive paths, we can look at things that are very close to each other or very far from each other. And uh, for the case where they are very far to each other, there are some results that are known about how likely it is that one of these uh, uh, super diffusive paths is very far away from the average value. And it has this uh, uh, exponential form that rather than delta x squared over tau, it's like delta x cubed over tau squared, uh, an interesting form. Uh, and at short distance, again, we had no reason to believe that it would be proportional to delta x, but numeric seems to uh, prove that that is the case. So we have this intriguing numerical form, and uh, currently we don't have any uh, theoretical explanation for why uh, this form is uh, valid, but it has some nice correspondence to the case of the diffusive paths. So those uh, details aside, what have we learned? Essentially, what we have found uh, can be expressed very simply, that uh, because the front does not stay flat and become super diffusive, two important observations we can make one of them is that the diversity of uh, gen uh, genetic forms very rapidly disappears, much more rapidly if they were doing diffusion. You can see that in this case, the number of colors has uh, gone away much more rapidly and, uh, in this case. And secondly, that uh, we have uh, fewer common ancestors. There's many, many more lines of ancestry that continues here, the lines of ancestry coalesce much more rapidly. So common ancestors are fewer, and uh, you have to go only a little bit further back in order to find common ancestor compared to the case that they were diffusing. Okay. Now, for these experiments and the explanation that I have given, uh, the two uh, species were supposed to be, in essence, identical, except that they were uh, fluorescing in different colors. Now, in reality, it could be that uh, one of the species is more fit and is stronger than the other and wins the competition more rapidly. So, for example, maybe uh, the gray species in this picture is more fit than the blue species and naturally would take over uh, if uh, uh, they were uh, uh, allowed to continue. So this advantage of one species over the other uh, can be parameterized by something that I will call G, which is the relative growth rate of uh, the active form versus the inactive form that I have labeled by A and I. Now, another thing that I have allowed in this picture, however, is that the gray particles spontaneously can mutate to blue particles. So mutation is another thing that can occur. And uh, in biological systems, and uh, let's say that occurs at the rate mu. So if I had a well-mixed population that was governed by this competition in the different growth rates and the possibility of mutation, the fraction of the active particles, which has an advantage, uh, would uh, initially grow exponentially with this uh, advantage G, but ultimately when it uh, uh, has completely won the competition and the fraction re reaches one, then it has to stop. So essentially this is the growth and saturation if of the species that has advantage G. If additionally it can mutate back to the inactive form, it uh, gets depleted at the rate mu. So if I were to solve for the steady state of this equation, eventually f will uh, uh, reach a value that is uh, slightly less than one because of this mutation. And if I were to in fact dial up the mutation, the fraction would actually go to zero when mu becomes g. And so there is a transition that is going to take place when this parameter tau, the difference between mu and g hits zero. And essentially that transition corresponds to the extinction of this phase, because we can see that if F by chance happens to be zero, it will always stay zero. So F equals to zero is an absorbing state. 
if you have uh, uh, all of one color, then the other color, if it's not allowed to appear by mutation, will never appear. And uh, if I were to sort of run this uh, process for uh, many times, we can see that in uh, when we are looking at this process going on in space, maybe this blue will eventually uh, uh, win over gray. It hasn't quite managed to do that uh, as I am approaching this transition. But there are these large fluctuations that are taking place that can be described by correlation lengths, sizes of domains, etc. So there is certainly critical behavior that is inherent in this system as this parameter tau goes to zero and you approach extinction. And uh, uh, from the perspective of critical phenomena, this extinction transition is supposed to belong to the directed percolation universality class. And essentially, if I were to take this mean field equation and allow for variations of x in space, then I can add a term that is like a diffusion operator that tries to uh, smoothen out any variations in F. But additionally, there is going to be noise and stochasticity because the processes by which something happens or reproduction takes place has a certain amount of randomness in it. And the appropriate form of the strength of the randomness for these processes has a square root of f, one minus f in it, so that if f is either zero or one, the fluctuations disappear because there's uh, uh, no spontaneous uh, change of color that they can take place. Uh, so looking at this equation close to the point where uh, f goes to zero, uh, is the way that the directed percolation universality class is, this, uh, is studied in field theory. And essentially you have to take that uh, nonlinear partial differential equation that is stochastic and analyze it by various methods that people have done such as the normalization group in order to characterize the nature of the critical behavior that you have for this system. Now, if I were to uh, the way that I simulated this system looks like the model that I was doing before with the possible addition of this uh, mutation and then giving some advantage in which uh, one particle, uh, one species has over the other. But uh, I uh, simulated it in the fashion that corresponded to layer by layer growth in the previous way that I had described things which I told you is unnatural if you have range expansion because there is no reason why to maintain this layer by layer growth and the growth and competition of these species uh, can take place on a rough surface. And so then the question is, is uh, the nature of the transition different because you are allowing for this possibility of rough surface and the shape of the domains and the characteristics visually looks different between the two cases when I allow for the rough surface. So if I were to try to understand this problem from the perspective of field theory, what should I do? Well, one thing that I can do is I can say, forget about the different colors. How does the height of this surface evolve as a function of time? Now, Typically, if you have a flat layer by layer growth, the height would uniformly move as a function of time. But because of the stochasticity in the addition of these particles, there is some randomness in which the height takes place. But then clearly there are processes that smooth out the surface. So there is something like a Laplacian of H that tries to remove the deformations that are caused by this randomness. But uh, additionally, there are other terms in the gradient expansion. And indeed, one can show that in order to properly describe the fluctuations, one has to go to the next order possible term in the gradient expansion, which is gradient of h squared. OK, so that's how we would describe the height. But what about the fluctuations in the color, the number of species being blue or gray? So what we can before was that the uh, uh, the fraction of uh, particles that was gray was described by uh, 
uh, this equation that was the thing that eventually uh, described the direct percolation universality class. And we had the equation that was describing the height, but these two processes could, are clearly coupled to each other. So in the same sense that we made a gradient expansion here, we can ask if I were to look at the lowest order gradient terms that couple the equation for the height and the equation that one had previously for describing the uh, fractions. And uh, uh, what we find is that the lowest order terms that are possible to write down are in fact just these four terms that I have indicated over here. Uh, the term alpha f here is really a description that uh, let's say uh, uh, there is no reason why the blue or gray would grow at the same rate. So if I had uh, some difference between the rate at which a blue region or a gray regions would uh, uh, move in time, that would be uh, described by this preference alpha f here. And the additional terms that are described over here uh, are couplings that uh, essentially indicate if the surface is deformed, so it has a gradient or a Laplacian, how does it modify the way that the uh, fractions are changed? Because potentially the way that the reproduction takes place on a rough surface would be different from the way that it grows on a flat surface. And I will describe the effect of these terms later on, but I will briefly mention that uh, our original motivation with Jordan Forowitz proposing these equations was to try to see the difference between the critical phenomena that are described by these two systems and try to generalize the field theory that was describing the direct percolation to the case of this coupling. Uh, we did that and we did appropriate renormalization group, but unfortunately the uh, uh, epsilon expansion that we could do, we could not find any uh, uh, nice critical points that we could uh, describe because there, were, there was flow to strong coupling. So essentially other than to say that these two universality classes have to be different, because of the relevance of these four parameters that we have introduced, uh, we cannot uh, point out exactly to what the new critical exponent for these, uh, 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 this new universality class has to be. But uh, uh, if parameters are relevant, that means that you can also measure them through uh, some uh, macroscopic uh, uh, processes, they have macroscopic manifestations. So rather than looking at uh, critical behavior and fluctuations, we can try to uh, uh, motivate what experiments can, could be done to calculate these uh, new parameters that we have introduced that are the descriptors of the problem at the microscopic level. And just to sort of uh, give you an idea of uh, the kind of thing that uh, I have in mind. Let's say this parameter lambda that was describing the evolution of uh, a surface by itself, irrespective of the colors of the species that were contained within it, uh, the way that you would macroscopically extract it is that you would grow uh, the surface on a tilted plane that has a slope and ask what is the growth in height. And uh, uh, the average growth in height is going to be different because you are growing on a slope surface by an amount that is proportional to slope squared to the lowest order in slope. And so by doing these measurements of velocity as a function of slope and fitting to a parabola, for a particular microscopic model, you can identify what this macroscopic parameter lambda is. If you had isotropic growth, that is the species was growing the same irrespective of uh, tilting the underlying substrate, uh, this lambda would become exactly the same as V0 because you would be expanding something like square root of one plus gradient squared. Uh, but uh, for different models, lambda could be different. And indeed in the model that we uh, 
uh, introduced originally, if we calculate the growth velocity as a function of slope, it has a negative curvature. So lambda could as well be negative. Okay, so this is something that was well known. What about the new parameters that we have introduced? Well, one of the important parameters is the coupling uh, that was between the gradient of uh, the uh, fraction and the gradient of the slope. And if I look at this term, it corresponds to something like a uh, uh, translating a pattern of f with the velocity that is uh, a gradient of h. So it says that uh, uh, if you are uh, looking at the way that sector boundaries are uh, changing on a sloped surface, uh, you can look at the velocity by which they are moving. And essentially the velocity by which they are moving either to the right or to the left could be determined by the slope through a proportionality constant that is this parameter beta one. And again, by appropriate choice of rules for how the growth was taking place in our model, we could simulate the cases where this parameter was either positive and the boundaries were going down slope or where this parameter was negative and the sector boundaries were going up slope. So this is a macroscopic man uh, manifestation that allows you to identify this parameter. The other parameters, if you look at them, you can see that essentially uh, the previously there was this parameter tau that when it went to zero uh, indicated the location of the extinction transition. And we can see that uh, the additional parameters that I have written that were proportional to H are, can be regarded as a, mo a modi modification of this parameter tau. Essentially what it says is that if you are, let's say on a sloped surface, forget about the curvature term, if you are on a sloped surface, the location of the transition can be modified by an amount that is proportional to the square of the slope. That is, if there is a, uh, extinction transition on a flat surface, who says that if you were to look at a sloped surface, the extinction transition would occur at exactly the same point. The location of the transition could be modified by an amount that depends on the properties of uh, the surface, including its slope as well as curvature. Uh, finally, uh, the uh, probably the most important parameter that uh, we had indicated was this uh, alpha that was appearing on how height of the surface uh, was growing depending on whether you had one species or the other. And uh, again, there is a linkage between this parameter alpha and this parameter lambda. And uh, the morphologies of the surfaces that we have do depend on whether this lambda is positive or negative. So this is uh, the top picture is a case where the gray species is uh, bigger and faster and grows more so that you do expect that it bulges up and the blue is left behind. As long as lambda is positive, the bulge has this particular shape over here where there's a flat gray and then there is a slope version of the blue. Whereas if lambda is negative, the shape, the morphology of this has changed completely. And rather than getting a bulge, you get a V-shaped uh, thing that grows out. And again, the explanation for this is that uh, lambda negative means that the sloped surface grows more slowly. So by making it uh, sloped, it can try to match with a slower growth, uh, growth that you have on the blue region. Whereas in this case, by making uh, it sloped, the blue region can try to catch up with the gray region. So different morphologies appear with different choices of these parameters in the system. And in, part, in practice, I guess, by looking at the different uh, uh, morphologies of growth of different species, one can characterize at least 
quite immediately the sign of the various parameters that are involved and we have introduced. Finally, uh, I would like to uh, initially seems to change the problem, but then I will go back uh, to the same problem. Uh, there is a, a well-known model of uh, species that are competing with each other and uh, uh, mutating and growing at different rates. Uh, that is uh, due to uh, Eigen, it's called Eigen's model of uh, quasi-species. So let's say that uh, we have a general number of species. Previously, we had two species, but we could have more species. And uh, I will use the label alpha to indicate species one, two, three, two, however many that I have. And uh, let's say that uh, I put these uh, species on a flat surface and uh, their numbers will change as a function of time and they're allowed to diffuse on the surface. So this Laplacian is essentially the diffusion of this species on the surface. Uh, species alpha will grow at a rate that is, I will indicate G alpha. So it will naturally grow exponentially. I will allow it to mutate between the different species. So the species uh, uh, alpha could uh, at some rate uh, mu beta alpha uh, mutate to beta and alternatively mu uh, species beta could mutate back to alpha. So this is a combination of, uh, of uh, species that are uh, growing and uh, uh, mutating among each other and diffusing on the surface. Now the thing that I is very different from everything that I have written and makes this problem both unrealistic and solvable is that uh, uh, this is a linear equation. So this can be described by a linear operator acting on the species, although the diffusion is non-local, but still linear. And in principle, one can solve it uh, uh, by exponentiating this, uh, this operator. Uh, so it's nice, it's exactly solvable, but it is completely unrealistic because uh, the number uh, uh, is growing exponentially. Uh, so essentially, if I were to add all of the different species, uh, the total number that I would have at each point uh, would be growing exponentially with an average rate that is obtained by summing uh, the growth rates of the different species times their fraction. So F alpha is the fraction of species alpha. So you say, okay, this is, this is not good because uh, uh, it becomes unrealistic for this exponential growth to uh, last forever. Uh, so maybe what I can do is rather than looking at uh, the number itself, just look at the fraction. So I uh, convert this equation to an equation that governs the fraction. And when I do that, I find a piece that is interesting, that is essentially each fraction grows as the difference of its own growth uh, minus the average growth. There's the mutation among the different fractions and there's the uh, diffusion. So it kind of looks like the equation that we had started with uh, that was start, uh, describing directed percolation, except that uh, unfortunately, again, this exponential growth does appear here in that uh, the gradient of uh, the fraction gets coupled to the gradient of log n. So if you just go and uh, do the manipulation of this, these two equations, you get this. So it's not quite the equation that we want for this uh, so what is nice is that we can actually use this uh, in order to go and make a, a path back to the original uh, uh, range expansion model. So let's uh, use what is called the Kohl-Hopf transformation and introduce a height function that is related to the logarithm of the total number that is growing exponentially. And again, if, if the uh, n is growing exponentially, clearly log of n 
is growing at a constant rate. So it kind of looks like uh, the front that is moving at a constant velocity. Okay, so we just randomly, well, not randomly through this transformation call this log, uh, log of n height function. And we can ask uh, uh, what are the equations now getting rid of log n in terms of this quantity h through this transformation, we find that the uh, evolution of uh, uh, the height is uh, related to this uh, equation that we had proposed earlier. Uh, I'm doing the deterministic version of that, so I have thrown out the noise. So I have the Laplacian term and the gradient square term. And uh, this is the generalization of the term that I had called alpha f. It is also something that is linear in f because g bar is linear in all of the f's. So essentially, this is uh, a, a representation of uh, a height uh, that follows the equations that we had pr produced before. But uh, the way that it grows at different locations depends on which uh, set of species are located at that, what fraction of species are there. And the equation for the fractions actually also looks like the equation that we had introduced because uh, of the transformation that I had over here, uh, the gradient of uh, the way that the concentrations are changing gets coupled to the gradient of H. So it's not the complete set of equations that I had proposed before, because I don't have the other set of terms that are uh, like uh, uh, f times Laplacian of h, etc. But it is an equation that is in that class. There is also some symmetry because the coefficient of the gradient of h squared lambda is actually the coefficient of this grad f grad h, the quantity that I was previously calling beta one. So if I want to make that transformation, I am forced to sort of look at a simplified version of the equations that I had that I don't have all of the terms, but only some fraction of them with certain symmetries. But the thing is that this reduced set of equation can actually be solved exactly because they can be mapped to this eigen equation that is linear and can be solved exactly. And so, for example, if I look at a, a case where I start with a, a seeding of species on a rough surface uh, and then solve these equations, essentially, uh, through this transformation, I can relate the height and the total number n. Total number n is the sum of the different components, and these different components can be solved through this equation that was linear. And if I forget the mutations, essentially there's a bunch of species that are growing at different rates. They are diffusing and starting from an initial height function. So this is eventually the result of uh, this deterministic equation that is exactly solvable. So let me describe to you what is going on, sorry. Uh, so I start with an initial profile where uh, the initial happy that is not flat, but has mountains. So rather than putting a, a flat edge of bacteria, I put a bacteria using a, a, a kind of a, a rough wire where uh, one of the uh, species is say on the top over here and the other species, the gray is over here. And I let it uh, evolve as a function of time starting from this initial condition. Now, what we find is that the solution to this equation uh, has this natural tendency to create for you these uh, uh, arcs. And what one can show again through this exact solution is that the species that are occupying an arc are related to the species that was at the top of the hill that eventually became this arc. Okay, you say what is uh, special about that? For the particular simulation that I made, 
the blue species was in fact inferior to the gray species. And if I had started the whole thing on a flat line, very soon the blue species would have gone extinct because the gray is, uh, uh, grows faster and is more fit than the blue. But by starting the blue at the top of a hill, I gave it a geometrical advantage, although it was less fit than the gray, and that geometrical advantage allowed this uh, uh, blue species to actually persist and create for itself a habitat and actually expanded at the expense of the gray. Now, actually, as a function of time, eventually uh, these arcs become flatter and the gray species will eventually eat the blue species and give, create a larger arc over here. But for a short amount of time, we can see that this uh, geometrical advantage of the location can allow a species that otherwise would have gone extinct to survive and thrive uh, by creating this niche. So I'm uh, towards the end of my time, so let me uh, summarize. So I started uh, talking to you about the competition between species that are expanding and going forward, this process of range expansion. And uh, there are very uh, nice uh, examples of that. And one can uh, try to model this uh, by uh, uh, these uh, simple uh, models. And the important thing to incorporate that seems to capture uh, the properties that are seen in the experiment is that the front uh, should be allowed to be rough. And uh, this roughness of the front, one of its simple consequences is that it causes the diversity to uh, uh, diminish uh, uh, more rapidly, and it causes these uh, geolo ge genealogical tracks to coalesce also more rapidly. And essentially, all of this can be uh, characterized by having these paths that are super diffusive and rather than say going like a diffusive t to the one half, they fluctuate as t to the two thirds. The next thing that we did was we asked, well, uh, what if we look at uh, uh, species that are uh, uh, have different growth rates and in particular allow mutations between them and uh, thereby look at the extinction transition. And for that, we found that we had to uh, modify the standard equation that was uh, uh, descriptive of the directed percolation universality class describing extinction by coupling it to the height function that is becoming rough. And the coupling of these two could be parameterized through a gradient expansion by four relevant parameters and that these relevant parameters had macroscopic manifestations uh, such as the drift of the sector boundaries and the shape of the bulges. And furthermore, there are some limits of these equations that are deterministic and can be solved exactly. So this is work that was done, as I mentioned before, with uh, former graduate student Sherry Chu, uh, former postdoc Jordan Horowitz, Daniel Beller and David Nelson at Harvard. And uh, thank you very much for uh, listening to me and I'm happy to take uh, questions. Well, thanks a lot for uh, Professor Carver for your very nice talk. It was very, I follow with high interest. So now we start uh, time for some questions. I, I found there are people here to interested to us. So, First one will be Martin Kaffer. Hello, uh, thank you very much, Professor, for your talk. It was really, really interesting. Uh, I would like to know if someone has studied the, how rugged the edge uh, generated by, by this growth is as in its fractal dimension or something like that, and how that relates to how fast these bacteria grow. 
again, thank you very much. Uh, okay, so uh, let me go over to here. So uh, uh, one way of parameterizing the rapidity of the growth is uh, through the dependence of the velocity on the average slope after you wash out all of the fluctuations. So this parameter lambda you can measure very easily. Uh, so that is after you average the fluctuations. Your question, I guess, was uh, uh, how is uh, this also manifested in the fluctuations? So uh, for the various numerical models uh, that I introduced, uh, uh, the nature of the roughness uh, has certainly been uh, looked at. So one can characterize uh, uh, the roughness of this boundary. And in one uh, plus one dimension that we are looking at, it has a square root dependence, just like a random walk. So uh, in some sense, you would say that the uh, self-affine nature of this boundary that has been characterized is not too different from the uh, traditional random walk and the super diffusive character is really uh, in the relationship between time and uh, space that is characterized by these geolo genealogical paths. Now the exciting thing of course is that when you go to uh, two plus one dimension, the roughness is very different and is non-trivial. Uh, now, there are a huge number of numerical simulations of the roughness that has been measured. Uh, as far as I know, in these uh, uh, bacterial systems, uh, I'm unaware of uh, anybody having uh, experimentally determined this, uh, the roughness exponents. Uh, okay, so we have time for more questions. Okay, so next question is from Peter Grasberger. Yeah, in, uh, you have a very nice talk. But the, <clears throat> you always assume that there are no overhangs. I assume if you have one species growing faster than another, then this would create such a strong bulb that Finally, I know where can exist. You can't hear me? Yes, yeah. uh, there is uh, a little bit of uh, 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 friction, but I can hear you. So let me, if, if I understood correctly, uh, what you're uh, uh, saying is that uh, if uh, one of the species is growing much more rapidly, uh, then it, it it essentially takes over and nothing you will see. And indeed, you're, you're right. If, if I were to run all of either of these simulations uh, a little bit longer, all I will see is either gray, uh, a gray line. So, uh, so this is an uh, unapproach uh, to the uh, uh, fate that you predicted. Uh, more questions? We have time for more questions. Well, I, if nobody wants to ask more, I have uh, many questions, so, but uh, I would like to ask just simple question. I am not a specialist in this research field, but um, this, this type of models can, can be applied, for example, for other, other type of uh, biological system like a virus or, uh, and explain, for instance, how um, in this COVID uh, uh, problem we have, uh, some um, variants of the virus appear, other disappear, or it's necessary to include other ingredients in the model. Uh, okay, so the some of the ingredients of the models that I have been talking about are certainly present in uh, uh, this way that various uh, uh, things such as uh, pandemics or uh, population spread. Uh, the thing to worry about is, uh, uh, let's say, for uh, uh, the, the 
the whole thing here is very much dependent on my doing a gradient expansion and a Laplacian operator. So I could see that if you are dealing with, say, uh, a species of uh, uh, insect uh, that is, uh, let's say, a species of worm that is uh, spreading on the surface, that that could be relevant. But if you have a species of uh, birds that are flying over long distances or pandemics that are transmitted by uh, uh, people traveling over airplane, then the uh, explanation that involves a Laplacian operator will uh, will need to be modified, and you have to change the uh, uh, connectivity that underlines this uh, picture that currently is a, uh, is a flat Euclidean geometry to some other network geometry. But apart from that, some of the uh, terms and concepts could potentially be applicable. OK, so if they are oh, another question. Okay, Sadi Kosi Isasi, you can ask. And hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Very nice talk. Um, I I would like to uh, to ask you if I am uh, correct. I have correctly understood. I think that uh, a main point of uh, what you have expressed here is that. <clears throat> um, the topological component of the process of growing is not irrelevant. You see, I'm from biological area. Uh, I'm biologist, essentially. I made some mathematical models, but I'm essentially a biologist. Mm -hmm. And when we compare growing and competing, we think in terms of genetics or, or um, a volume of individuals, chance of mutation, but what I find here very relevant is that the initial set in the spatial set, spatial set uh, in the space of the process is a, a main point to take into account in order to preview growth or elimination or competition from biological point of view or medical point of view. Am I correct in that? Yes, so I, I, I think, uh... You, you are correct, and in some sense, uh, uh, biologists uh, sort of introduce the idea of a niche that somehow, say, some species creates a niche and survives within that niche, although it may not be uh, uh, possible for it to uh, survive outside of that niche. So if you like, this picture that I have over here is the concrete mathematical explanation of that. And in this case, it is indeed the initial geometry uh, and the place that this uh, 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 less fit species was uh, placed that determines its ability to create its own niche and survive in that niche for a certain amount of time. So, uh, uh, Yes, I would say that the advantage of this model is maybe to provide a mathematical framework by which exactly the questions that you ask can be addressed. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have not time for more questions. So let's thanks again to Professor Cardon for, for his very nice talk. Okay. And we will pass to our next